Simple question this morning. Who do you want to be when you grow up? I know, kind of a crazy question when uh, like 90% of the room are ages 18 to 80 something, right? But we all need role models. We grow in years, hopefully we are growing in wisdom. Hopefully as we grow in years, we're growing in, in, in real maturity. And so it helps to look to others we admire so we can emulate their wisdom and, and their maturity. I know I do that all the time, even though I probably don't seem like I have a lot of wisdom or maturity. But the Apostle Paul knows that our need to get our bearings and cues for maturity by watching others is not only necessary in kind of our chronological growth, but it's also necessary for our spiritual growth. I mean, we've got God's word and we've got God's spirit to lead us, but but Paul indicates also, and God indicates in his word, that the instruction and example of others is critical for our formation. I mean, obviously, no, I'm surprised no one said, when I asked you who you wanted to grow up and be, you didn't say Jesus, right? That's like the Sunday school answer. And obviously, Jesus is the one we want to grow up into, right? And, and, and to look to. But as... <clears throat> The other scriptures tell us, because we don't have Jesus in the flesh with us day in and, and day out to see how we handle a situation the way he did, we need to look to others. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. God develops living and breathing imitators of of Jesus Christ within our churches. Within this church, God is raising up such people. Men and women whose hearts and minds have been conformed to the image of Jesus by God's word and by God's spirit for the sake of each other's spiritual growth. We are here for the sake of each other's spiritual growth, not only our own. Other Christians who, who lead and walk with us through this life as we hope on the next which is what we see in this week's passage as we continue our journey this summer through the book of Philippians. This week we are at Philippians chapter 2, verses 19 through 30. Have a Bible and want to open it to that place, please do. Philippians chapter 2, verses 19 through 30. <coughs> Excuse me, if you want to grab one of the Pew Bibles, it's page 922. In the thicker large print Bibles, it's page 1165 in Austin's I'm sure we're going to put that up on the screen any second now for us as well. Hear now God's word. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, so that I too may be cheered by news of you. For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy's proven worth. How as a son with a father, he has served with me in the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me. And I trust in the Lord that shortly I myself will come also. I have thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, and your messenger and minister to my need. For he has been longing for you all and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill, near to death. But God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I am, more, I am the more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again, and that I may be less anxious. So receive him in the Lord with all joy, and honor such men, for he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, humble and prepare our hearts to receive, to accept, to trust in your word, in our lives, uh, in the lives of this whole church, God, in our corporate life. Father, as over these next few minutes I unpack your word, I pray that you would stop me from any error in speaking or understanding. I pray that you'd accomplish your will for this message, all 
for the glory of Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. So as I mentioned the first week we started um, the book of Philippians, this is a very personal letter from the Apostle Paul to this tiny little church in in the small city of Philippi. By way of reminder, Paul is in prison. So Paul is writing this. He is is speaking um, to them from prison. He's in prison because he was speaking about Jesus. He was speaking about Christ and how Christ was, was crucified for our sins and how Christ rose from the dead, overcoming sin and death. And when he was preaching this everywhere that he went, it didn't play well with, with, with the religious leaders who rejected Jesus. And they rejected Jesus, as we've seen um, through the Gospels and through the epistles and the, in the New Testament, because they were jealous and because they were greedy. And it caused a persecution all throughout uh, the early church in the Roman Empire, this preaching of the gospel. And in this letter, you get to see the very personal nature, the very intimate nature of Paul's relationship with these believers in this little church in Philippi. You can sense his love. You can sense his devotion to, to the people within that church. And like it is for us today, uh, there was a lot of pressure for this little church in Philippi to, to swerve from following Christ, to, to just stop growing in Christ, right? to, to cave to the pressures of the, of the world and, and just move on rather than moving along with Jesus and, and, and with the body of Christ. And that's the reason that Paul reminds them and Paul reminds us that, that healthy life together in the church is a means of growing in faithfulness. Healthy life together in the church is a means of growing in faithfulness. God has given us this local church. He has given us Bethany Chapel. This is his church. He is building this church. We're not building this church. He is building this church. It is his church. And he's using this church as a means of growing each and every one of us who know Jesus Christ spiritually. And that's not a concept unique to this passage. It's all throughout the New Testament. It's all throughout um, all the epistles. As we saw, Kent, you preached a couple weeks ago, um, making that very point. But what's unique about this particular passage is Paul is zooming in. He is, he's going to show us about the intimate relationship that the church had and that he had with, with, through two examples of, of what this healthy life looks like. Uh, a man by the name of Timothy and a man by the name of Epaphroditus. And Paul shows us through them Three activities that we engage in in our life together which grow us in our faithfulness to Christ. And they are seeking, serving, and stirring. Seeking, serving, and stirring. First, as a body of Christ, we seek. So I mentioned that that Paul wrote this letter from prison in Rome. and, And he wrote to the church, verse 19, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon so that I too may be cheered by news of you. For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. What was Paul thinking about as he sat in prison in those dark days of him, his, when he wasn't sure if he'd be released or if he was going to be executed for his faith? He wasn't thinking about himself. No, he was seeking the interest of his brothers and sisters in Christ by sending Timothy to them. He knew Timothy's character. He he knew his spiritual maturity despite his young age. Timothy was very young. And he said, don't let them despise you because of your youth. He was wise in character. He was spiritually mature. And Paul knew that he would be genuinely concerned for the welfare of those in the church at Philippi. And when Paul uses that word concerned, it it literally is translated anxious, which doesn't mean that he was worried at all. It just means that literally, Timothy could not rest until he cared for the spiritual needs of the people in that church. And he'd be unlike, Paul said, the people he mentioned a few weeks ago when we looked at a passage before, Uh, He'd be unlike the people who were preaching Christ for their own gain, for their own um, exaltation instead of the exaltation of Christ. Timothy's motivation, Paul knew, is to seek Christ best for that church. 
Their spiritual growth wouldn't just be like another notch in, 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 in Timothy's belt. It wouldn't be more bragging rights. We could go to other believers and go, whoa, look at all the work I did over there with those people in Philippi. It wasn't a way for, for Timothy to beef up his resume. Timothy, Paul knew, would seek Christ's glory, not his own. Which meant, as we just sang perfectly in God's way, that it would be for the ultimate good of believers. <clears throat> you want to be led by, you want to emulate other Christians who are generally concerned about your interests, that are concerned about the interest of others within the church rather than their own interests. Those who, who, who don't seek their own interests, but seek the interests of Christ. You see, that's what we're to seek. Not our own interests, not even necessarily always what, what other people want, but we're to seek the interests of Jesus Christ. I mean, Timothy's yearning to be with his brothers and sisters in Christ stands in sharp contrast to what a lot of we see, a lot of what we see in the, in the church in America today. It stands in contrast to Christians who are consumers, right? Our whole culture is consumeristic and it creeps its way into the church and into each one of us. It makes people more individualistic. It makes them more preoccupied with, with busyness or, or getting noted for their busyness. What he's talking about stands in contrast to Christians who regard involvement with other believers in worship or fellowship as a job. Oh, I had to go to church today. Oh, I had to serve in church today, right? They look at it as a job or a duty, which interrupts their personal time, right? Something that takes away from our leisure, something that takes away from our amusement because we constantly need to be amused. Right? There's no sense of shared life. There's, there's only little categories. We, got, we have a box for, you know, for, for me and, and Jesus in worship. We got a box for, for me serving Jesus. We got a box for my personal devotions for Jesus and then everything else. Right? And those boxes can never spill over, right? There's my church time, my time with Jesus, the rest of my life. Right? No conception that all of these things are actually the same. They, they should all meld together as we are unified in our complete life around Jesus. The life we've been given by Jesus. Right? In our culture today, there's no sense of, of life together, only a life that's all about me and what I can get out of it. And all that comes from a misunderstanding about how Activity two, we serve. We serve. Paul continues on, verse 22. But you know Timothy's proven worth, how as a son with a father, he has served me, served with me in the gospel. Timothy's track record, he had a track record with Paul of serving. And that track record that Timothy had of serving along with Paul was something that these believers in this church in Philippi could look back on. They could see the way that Timothy has served others before. He had a track record of God's grace working in his lives and of his character. And they saw how it was for Christ and not for him. And that serving is grounded, Paul tells us, Timothy's serving is grounded in the gospel, he says. Three very important words. It's grounded in the gospel. It's talking about Timothy's position, his position being in the gospel. Right? That's from the place from which Timothy serves that allows him to seek their interest in welfare for Christ. Now, what's the gospel? I need to remind everyone of what the gospel is because not everyone understands maybe what the gospel is. Gospel literally means good news. And it's the good news that Jesus lived, died, and rose again for the forgiveness of our sins. Right? Jesus paid the penalty for our sins on the cross to make us right with God. And, and, and that is for all who identify with him through faith. And Christ rose from the dead, overcoming sin and death. Right? That's the gospel. That's the good news, that, that Jesus did for us what we don't have to do for ourselves couldn't do for ourselves. And that's the gospel that Paul says Timothy is serving out of, that, that, that he, he is serving in. You might go, so what does that mean? What does that mean to serve in the gospel? It means that Timothy's 
service for Christ and, and, and the church is grounded like the foundation of, of what he's serving out of is the gospel. In other words, Christ had validated him. Right? Christ had justified him in God's eyes. So he didn't need to go outside for, for validation. He didn't need to go outside to try to justify himself through his own actions because Jesus had already validated him in the cross and the resurrection, already made him right with God, already justified him before God so he didn't have to go out trying to justify himself for everything he did. He no longer had to, to, to advocate for himself because he had an advocate already in Jesus. There was nothing to strive after other than living for Christ in all his life. That's what happens when you are grounded in the gospel. You've got nothing else to try to fight for, live for, but Jesus. Nothing else to prove, another way to be right, to serve him in everything without fear or angst. You see, Timothy knew that he was secure in Jesus. So many of us are seeking security in something or someone. And that's a dead end that goes nowhere. But our security can be in Jesus Christ if we put our trust in him and what he has done for us. We stand eternally secure. No one can bump us. No one can take us off that spot. Jesus will never leave you nor forsake you. Paul said Timothy also had a proven worth. Again, they just use the actual words. It means tested by fire. Literally, it's tested by fire. Right? Timothy had been through all sorts of adversity. Right? If he's hanging out with Paul, you're going to go through adversity. You know anything about Paul? All sorts of adversity for Christ and for Christ's church. And Timothy came out the other side, tested by fire. He wasn't burned. Right? He was unscathed because he rested in Christ through the fire. No matter what came at him, no matter what happened in his life, no matter how he felt in the moment, he was secure in Christ, tested through fire, standing on the rock. That meant he didn't need to defend himself all the time, right? We're so good. This guy Paul Tripp talks about us being our best inner, own inner lawyers, right? We are great lawyers. We are always on the defense for ourselves, defending ourselves against everything, myself included, right? He didn't need to defend himself. Christ already justified him. He didn't need to advocate for himself. He didn't need to justify himself because it wasn't all about him. It was all about Jesus, all those things had been taken care of in Christ. And he could serve from a heart that was refined by fire. No other motivation. Think about it. Think about what it means to, to be in the gospel. To be in the gospel of Jesus Christ. What if every time you started to feel weak, every time you started to feel other than Every time you started to feel inadequate, every time you thought you weren't validated in a conversation or by someone else, what if every one of those times you looked to the gospel of Jesus Christ and you looked at what he has done for you, the price that he paid for you, out of love for you, you would press on. You wouldn't need those other things because Christ has already purchased all that for you. It is yours in Christ just through faith. There's nothing you have to do. He's done it all for you. And your identity is now in Jesus. Man, if we could just all do that, we'd be able to walk into really hard places, right? Like, who likes conflict in this room? Anyone like conflict? If you do, maybe there's something wrong, right? But <clears throat> we'd walk into conflict wearing the gospel, right? Not having to be right about everything, right? Having to having to defend ourselves. We work to resolve conflict clothed in Christ. Not worried about being right, justifying ourselves because we've already been right, made right, already been justified by Jesus. We don't have to worry about winning the argument every time or being certain, seen a certain way by people, right? I used to be really good at that, wanting to be seen as a certain way. Where you just joyfully, faithfully live for Jesus. I mean, what else do you have to worry about? Everything's been done for you. You can live in Christ. Resting in the gospel. Growing in the gospel. Paul continues on, verse 23. I hope, therefore, to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me. And I trust in the Lord that shortly I myself will come also. That's so refreshing. That is so 
Paul knew that no matter what was going on in his life, he didn't know if he's going to be executed. He didn't really know if he's going to be released. He just had a sense he might be released. <clears throat> he had this deep awareness that God is the one that controls his life. Again, God lines up the songs perfectly for his glory and our good. That he dictates the how and when of our serving. And in all those things, Paul is saying, I trust the Lord. No matter what happens, I trust the Lord. Every circumstance of your life is in the hands of Jesus. Your whole life belongs to Jesus. And that's a very healthy way. That's a very necessary way to live your life if you're a Christian, is to know that, to rest in that. Which means every interruption. Who loves interruptions, right? When you're working on something, interruption. Oh, right? <clears throat> every inconvenience. Every planned and unplanned moment are in service to Jesus. If your whole life is about Jesus, if your whole life is resting in Jesus. But it's way more than that. Paul shifts to another brother, this man, Epaphroditus. Verse 25. I have thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier and your messenger and minister to my need. Guy's got a lot of titles, right? Imagine putting that on a business card, right? <laughs> Might fit on the email on the bottom, but... He's a brother, right? He's a fellow worker. He's a fellow soldier. He's a, a messenger. He's a minister, right? These are, these are jobs. These are roles that, that he has. They're what his life has been called to. Right? We, he's a brother. First of all, we're all brothers. If we know Jesus Christ, we are all brothers and sisters in Christ and of one another, right? If we're brothers and sisters of one another. We're united, right? And that's meant to be an unbreakable union, not only with Christ, but with each other. He's a fellow worker. Think about that. There's no longer such a thing as retirement if you're a Christian. He's a fellow worker, right? We can't say in the church, well, I've had my time serving. It's now someone else's turn to serve. I'm just going to sit back. I know there are seasons of life. I know there's disabilities. I know that um, the way things work out, sometimes you cannot serve, and that's not what he's talking about here. Right? We have limitations. We may have to change roles because of our age or disability. There are several people in our church, I don't want to point because I haven't talked to them about it, but who have, were super involved in so many things, and now they're still faithful to do the things that they can do. And it's quite an encouragement when you see what they do in this church and how they continue to serve despite their disabilities, despite their limitations. I was talking with someone on the phone the other day who was unable to do anything, really, and, and this person felt really bad that they couldn't do anything. And I'm like, what do you mean? You're telling me about how you're praying all the time for our church. That's a great thing. So they can have change of roles due to age or disability, but there's no retirement when you're a Christian. You don't retire from, from living for Jesus. God works through every single one of us in the body of Christ. It's not people of a, of a certain ability. It's not people of a certain age. It's not people you know, with a certain education that are, that are more valuable to the church than other. We are all, as Scripture says, members of one another. We are all equally needed by Christ to accomplish his mission within the church. Epaphroditus is a fellow soldier, which means that we are at war. We talked about that maybe three or four weeks ago. As Christians, we are at war. Ephesians 6.12, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. As Paul said back then, we are in shoulder-to-shoulder shoulder fighting with one another in the spiritual battle, right? We press on. We move forward in the battle, drawing our strength not only on Christ, but with our unity in the body. No ceasefires, right? And, and the biggest thing that Satan loves to do is divide us, to distract us, to, to get us off the gospel and onto something else. Epaphroditus is a messenger of the good news, and he's a minister. This word minister is the word for like a public servant. That's why in some European countries they have the minister of this, the minister of that. They're a public servant. He is a public servant, meaning his, his role is to serve others within the body. 
So selfless was his service, verse 30. He nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. Christ was enough for Epaphroditus. If he lost his life, if his life was degraded somehow in serving Christ, so be it. As Paul said a few weeks ago, to live is Christ, to die is gain. This is live time, guys. He had eternity with Christ and his fellow believers ahead of him. Before we move on from Epaphroditus' near-death experience, right, when he almost died, he was so sick, I just want to address kind of a lie that's out there right now these days. You hear it a lot on social media. Uh, if you click on some of the links, you see it on YouTube a lot. You might hear it in, in some churches. Um, this thing called the prosperity gospel. I've talked about it before, but I feel like I've got to talk about it again. Right? They teach that health and prosperity is a birthright of those who are the real Christians. Right? It, it's a right. If you're a real Christian, then you should be prosperous. You should be healthy. Right? If you have enough faith, you'll be healthy enough. If you have enough faith, you'll be prosperous enough. Well, when we read verse 27 that Epaphroditus was ill near to death, right? you'd think according to their teaching it's because he didn't have faith. Become, somehow he was out of favor with God. Like, or he had some sin that you know, everyone else hadn't figured out yet. In fact, Epaphroditus' very life refutes that lie. Paul said that, yeah, he was really sick, but verse 30, he should be held in high honor. Epaphroditus was sick because he ran his life to the edge for Jesus, for the sake of the gospel, while serving in the gospel. In fact, God didn't let him die out of his mercy and grace. Which leads us to the last activity we engage in in the body. We stir. We stir. Thank you, Michelle, for that great transition on this one. Paul is sending Epaphroditus back to the church in Philippi. That's where he originally came from. Now that Epaphroditus has recovered, and because Paul is delayed, he sends him on. And he tells the church, verse 29, <clears throat> Receive him in the Lord with all joy, and honor such men. This word honor, we've talked about it before. It means to show value, to show to worth to someone. A lot of times it's, it's speaking of God. But in this situation. It's talking about this man, Epaphroditus. And what it's getting at is, is he has a role of encouraging other people. Right? He is being sent to encourage them in their service, in their faithfulness for Christ. Now when you hear that word encourage, sometimes we confuse it with flattery. Do you know what the difference is between flattery is when you tell someone something to butter them up, as my mother used to say. Not really sure what that means. That sounds kind of messy. <laughs> but it means you're, you're exaggerating whatever you're telling them, right? You're, you're telling them that something that's not true because you're trying to ingratiate yourself, right? You're giving them a compliment to get something out of them. That's flattery. But when you encourage a brother or sister, you're telling them what you see God doing in their lives and how that encourages your faith. Right? You're looking at their lives and you're seeing something that God's doing in it and wow, you tell them, I can't believe what God's doing in your life. Right? I hear you guys say that to each other all the time. And it encourages not only your faith as you're telling them, but it encourages that person too. Seeing others give their lives to Jesus like Epaphroditus is encouraging. Paul was, verse 19, encouraged by the anticipated news of what God was doing to the believers in Philippi. And just hearing Epaphroditus' story would stir up his brothers and sisters in Christ, hearing how God used him in the battle for the gospel. Do you know how easy it is to stir up to encourage another believer in Christ? Do you know how incredibly easy it is to do? You need a pair of these, and you need a pair of these, and even you don't need both of them probably. You just have to look. You just have to look and see what God is doing in people's lives. I tell you too often, too often in our culture and even in our church and even myself sometimes, I find myself being the fruit inspector. And I don't mean going out to see all the fruit of the spirit that people are growing in, but like where something missing, right? And what if we changed? What if we went out and we actually opened our eyes and every time we saw people, we were looking for what God was doing in their lives? How would that encourage them? How would that encourage you? 
How would that encourage our church? How would it radically reshape all those things? As Michelle said, the author of Hebrews gets at this point when he says, Hebrews 10.24, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. And then there was a verse after that that goes with it, verse 25, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. You can just stir one another up. You can encourage other people by showing up. How about that? You can encourage other people. You can stir other people up by showing up. Sunday morning, Bible study, Thursday night, food pantry, wherever it is, barbecues. When you show up in the body, you're encouraging and stirring up other people. And when you're not, it's not getting, the pot's not getting stirred so much. And I don't mean like the hornet's nest. I mean like encouragement in ways that build us up. If we grow through the stirring up and encouragement of one another in the church. So, who do you want to be when you grow up? Jesus. I know, I know. <laughs> Same. If, as Paul and the whole New Testament suggests, healthy life together in the church is a major means of growing faithfulness, then how invested are you in others in the local church? And I don't mean just showing up in church. I mean, how invested are you in the lives of other people in this church? And who's investing in your life in this local church? Now, I know it would be easy to say, isn't that the pastor's job? And I would say, well, it's the pastor's and the elder's job <laughs> and the deacon's job. But it's incumbent on you, too. It works both ways. And our leadership is working on a project right now to engage more of us in life with each other, as you'll be hearing about in the coming weeks, as you'll be getting phone calls and emails and texts and all that in the coming weeks to talk about that. But it depends on you as well. What God has given us in Christ in the gospel and offers us in the local church is what grows our faith, is what grows our joy, it's what grows our peace, it's what grows our satisfaction in Christ as we fight the good fight in this world on our way to the next. It's what equips you for life and to be the bearers of light and life to a world in desperate need. You're made for us and we're all made for you. We all, 1 Corinthians 6.20, were bought with a price, Paul said, so glorify God in your body. And we glorify God every time we come together in this body to partake of this table. A table where we're reminded of the price we were bought at. A price that levels all of our pride, all of our sense of self-sufficiency. This table takes away all that. Jesus has done what we can't do for ourselves. And if you think I've got this and everything in life, you don't got it. But Jesus does. And we are united in this church in our need for our communion with Christ and one another. So today, if you've trusted in Christ, if you've put your faith in Jesus Christ and what he's done in the cross and in the resurrection, then come